Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another super special VN Happy Hour. I'm VN Times editor Rachel Gozzle. Now, Mr. James Westgate is off on his honeymoon this month, so I have Jack Pye, RVN, BVNA council member, and at this point, Happy Hour Pro, stepping in to co host with me. So thanks for that, Jack. I'm so pleased to have you here with me this evening. Hi, everyone. Um, delighted to be here again. Um, so to help with this evening's um, happy hour all about behaviour. Yes, thank you again, Jack. So this happy hour is brought to you in association with Bought by Many, voted Pet Insurance Provider of the Year at the 2021 Money Facts Consumer Awards. They work with vet nurses and owners to help pets have happy and healthy lives. Join their Many Nurses Club on Facebook to connect with their vet nurses and get a £50 Amazon.co.uk gift card when you take out a Bought by Many policy. All Bought by Many vet fee policies include behaviour as standard. Visit their website www.boughtbymany.com to find out more. Tonight we'll be focusing on behaviour, as I'm sure you're all aware, with our fabulous, fabulous panel. Um, how, as vet nurses, we can support owners of animals with behavioural issues, as well as the importance of using tier three methods in practice. That's right. So in our main interview this evening, I'll be chatting with Linda Ryan. Linda is an RVN who has been nursing since 2000 and is a veterinary technician specialist in oncology and behaviour and certificated clinical animal behaviourist. Linda is a passionate patient advocate and aims to be welfare centred across all areas of her work work with animals and she runs Inspiring Pet Teaching, a clinical animal behaviour referral service in the New Forest. Hello. And, oh, hi Linda. Um, and <laughs> straight after that, uh, Linda will be joining our other guests for our panel discussion. Um, you've sent loads of questions in, um, so we'll try and get through them all. And I know they are looking forward to sharing their thoughts and opinions with you all, and I certainly will probably learn a thing or two. Yep, so joining Linda on the panel, we have Zoe Blake, who runs her own pet nurse at home business, The Friendly Pet Nurse. She holds the ISFM Feline Friendly Nursing and Advanced Behaviour Certificates and is coming towards the end of her Compass Applied Feline Behaviour Management Diploma. Zoe also set up the Respect the Lead campaign in 2018, which aims to educate dog owners on go uh, good dog lead etiquette, and the campaign went viral, reaching all four corners of the globe. And then we also have Ellie Bowden, who also joins us. Um, Ellie stud studied the Advanced Diploma in Canine Behaviour Management and is currently completing her Master's in Clinical Animal Behaviour at the University of Edinburgh, after which she hopes to start her PhD. Mm -hmm. Wow. And Ellie works in first opinion practice alongside running her own behaviour business, The Behaviour Nurse, on Instagram and other social media platforms. She is a provisional member of the Association of Pet Behaviour Council Councillors and hopes to achieve full membership by the close of this year. Thank you, Jack. And of course, we also have stacks of cash prizes to give away this evening with £50 up for grabs in our picture challenge. Over the past few weeks, we have invited you to share your well-behaved pets with us and you still have time to do that. So please keep sending your videos and pictures in. The email is happyhour at bbd.co.uk. We love seeing those. And we will also be naming the winner of this month's Pay It Forward prize and announcing the two winners of the Megular popular, Mega Popular Top Tips competition. And on top of that, we also have our popular breakout sessions this evening for you to enjoy. Jack will be once again putting on his Quizmaster hat and running a quiz for you all. Or if you're probably sick of me by then, which I don't blame you, you can join Laura Copley um, from LC Fitness for a freestyle fitness yoga session if you're up for a bit of exercise this evening. Wonderful. So before we get started, please don't forget that happy hour is it's all about you guys. So please get chatting in the chat box, engage with each other. If you're feeling a bit shy, that's fine. You can direct message myself, Jack, Ebony or Katie, and we'd be more than happy to put a question or just put something in your behalf in the chat box. So please feel free to do that. And if you're on social media, let people know you're here by sharing hashtag VN Happy Hour. So we've got so much to cover, so let's get cracking. So over to you, Rachel, with the first interview. Thank you so much, Jack, and welcome, Linda. <clears throat> Hello. Hi, Linda. Thank Hi. you for having me. <laughs> you're so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, our delegates this evening have sent in so many questions so shall we just jump right in i'm happy to if you are yeah let's do it so 
have you always had an interest in behavior where did it all begin oh my gosh yes and it began with my two wayward collies who were misunderstood by me <laughs> and they taught me a lot and I, I started dabbling in training and all of the cats I've ever known and loved in my life um, but it really took off when I worked at Edinburgh University as a specialist oncology nurse and were very very quickly discovered that if we did not look at behavior and put it as equal as clinical health no matter how special we were at treating the cancer we were going to lose these patients from the protocol because they were telling their owners they did not want to be there. They were they were backing out. They were using aggressive behaviors. They were you know really really unhappy in the clinic when I took it over, and so we very quickly thought, gosh, we need to make better patient experiences so that we have happier animals in the clinic, and that was a huge learning journey for me, who wanted to be the best clinical nurse I could ever be and had never learned a thing about behavior. So really, it was integrating that that hobby. Um, that I'd started learning about with real life patients long before there was ever such a thing as cooperative care or fear free or anything we you know that didn't exist in those days we were just doing our best to have patients who were as, as mentally well looked after and emotionally well looked after as they were physically and clinically so that's where it all began and look at look what happened <laughs> <laughs> look at you now Wow. Um, so did you face any kind of pushback when you first broached this as an area you wanted to focus on in practice? No, because I think it wasn't a thing. Um, so I think now we have a lot of people struggling where they're maybe doing the fear free certification or the low stress handling certification or various other qualifications and going back to practice and saying, I want to do this. And it's a thing. And people may have not heard of it, or they may have heard of it. But when we were sort of starting, we were just trying to have our patients be as emotionally comfortable as they could be. And so we were finding our way. And we could see, as Susan Friedman always says, how do you know if it's working? Well, because it works. And so we were seeing patients who were doing better, who were pulling on their leads to come in, cats who were relaxed in the clinic. And so we didn't really have any pushback because we were, we were sort of forging a thing if you like and now it's a thing and sometimes it's very well received and sometimes it's not for me personally I find it very straightforward because usually I'm the one that somebody comes to and says can you come to my practice and talk to everybody so I'm being invited and that's a great way to try and educate people and and you know build it from the bottom up and so I think sometimes we're resistant to things we don't know and understand but these concepts of low stress handling, patient friendly practice, they're catching fire. And everybody is, is, you know, hoping and trying to be on the front foot with it these days. And so, you know, it's fantastic. Oh, that's so good to hear. That's great. Yeah. Um, so what kind of CPD or education on behavior topics is available at the moment? And would you say that's improved over the years? Yeah, definitely. You know, again, when I started, I remember being such a keen bean and there was really nothing available. There was a lot of old school let's be polite let's call it rubbish <laughs> based on very old-fashioned ideas very harmful ideas then it had been based on science from like 30 years ago which was then obsolete and now of course we would consider it abuse um, but back then that was all there was whereas nowadays there are some really great accredited courses so you there is now a career pathway for people who want to become behaviorists or specialize in behavior or just do more and integrate it into practice so whether you want to qualify at level six, which is the minimum standard for behaviorist, or whether you want to just brush up on your skills and learn more, there's a ton out there. And I would say, you know, make sure you know who your speaker is. Look for somebody who is appropriately qualified, not just somebody who's got a passion or who's bringing those old fashioned ideas with them. You want to look for CCABs, um, ABTC accredited clinical animal behaviorists, veterinary behaviorists, um, people who are appropriately qualified to do the teaching. And there's so much out there now. And at the moment, of course, with the pandemic, everything going online, everything is so much more accessible. So yeah, there's lots, which is great. Oh, that's good to hear. So plenty out there and something for everyone. Yeah, and the field is moving forward all the time, which is great because there's now, you know, there's a lot of study into the field as well, whereas before it was kind of grandmother's advice handed down. Um, so, you know, there's new research coming out and that's being built into all of the education, whether it's CPD or qualification. So it's, it's, it's fast moving, which is brilliant. That's good, yes. So uh, this delegate asked, I have an interest in companion, companion animal behaviour. How should I develop this further? Oh, 
well, depends where you want to go with it. So, you know, there are there are those who simply want CPD. So to just be better, to know more, to integrate it more. And there are those who want to go on and qualify. And there are those like me who didn't know that I wanted to qualify until I kind of was like three quarters of the way down the road and then went, oh, I need to keep going now. So if you want to become a qualified behaviorist, I suggest the best place to go is um, ASAB, the Association of Animal Behavior. And there's actually a career pathway all laid out there. So if you want to be a behaviorist, you need to have a minimum of level six in the topic. So a degree in, in behavior and welfare or behavior related studies. And there's loads of CPD out there, which is really fantastic as well. So Fear Free, for example, um, we all use the term colloquially, but it's actually a brand. It's actually a company and I, I work a lot with them, full disclosure. They do fantastic CPD courses, which you can do little bite size and integrate. Um, I run the BSABA um, Veterinary Nurse Merit Award, which is a nine month course. So that's a lot more in depth, um, which is fantastic. There's ISFM and International Cat Care. They run the wonderful, well, Zoe has, has done that course, which again, I'm very heavily involved with, but also little bite-sized bits. So really it depends where you want to go. Do you want to just brush up? Do you want to know more? Do you want to dip your toe? Or do you want to go all the way? And, and so, you know, look at ASAB and look at the, the, the high quality CPD as well. So BSABA is always good. ISFM is always good. Fear free. They're always great places to go. Karen Pryor Academy as well. Wonderful, that's great. And if you keep an eye on the chat boxes, we have links to work, all of these, so we'll share them with you as we... Thank you. Can. Thank you for typing faster than my brain can work. I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> so, welcome. so I would love to start my own business as a behaviourist. Any tips on how I can get started, such as qualifications needed, and how my vet nursing skill set will help with this? That's a really great question. And again, if you're going to call yourself a behaviorist at the moment, the industry is unregulated. And so, you know, my dog Evie can call herself a behavior expert and she can take people's money and give advice. And she'd probably be pretty amazing because she's pretty amazing, but she has no qualifications. Um, and so anybody can call themselves a behaviorist. And I think in many cases, people feel like behavior is it's what everything that's alive does. And so we all feel it's very accessible, but I would also caution against that little knowledge being a dangerous thing thing because it's very in depth and there's a huge amount of damage to be done if we don't know what we're doing. So I think one of the things as veterinary nurses, which we're very strong on is welfare, is client communication, is following the RCBS guidelines to understand our limitations and know when to refer. So all of that is kind of built in. Um, and then deciding which level you're at, you know, are, are you, can you train? Are you a qualified trainer? Are you an animal behavior technician, which is kind of level five? Um, a lot of nurses are building that into to what they do in practice or, you know, kind of starting out. And then there's the level six, which is your clinical animal behavior level. But I think if you're going to call yourself a behaviorist, yes, you can do that. But please, I would really encourage you not to use that term unless you genuinely have that qualification, because we want owners to understand what they're getting. We want to uphold the profession and we want veterinary nurses to be underpinning that. And I think veterinary nurses are the perfect people to become behaviorists because we're so integrated in terms of body and soul. So I think we've got a huge skill set that we can bring and integrate the whole thing. Um, and, you know, when you're ready to start your business, go for it. Once you've got those qualifications under your belt and you know what your niche market is and where you're aiming for and whether it's going to be part of practice or whether it's going to be something you do independently and you know whether it's going to be training whether it's going to be behavior so figure out what you want to do first and then find a way to make it happen and being a vet nurse will make it all the more fabulous that's some great advice there um so what things have you learned most from starting up your own referral service oh wow <laughs> A lot. <laughs> I learn from every animal and every human I work with. I'm so grateful to have incredible clients, incredible animals to work with, amazing referring veterinary practices. So they, they teach me a lot. And I think every interaction that we have, we learn a lot. And I think we should be learning from our animals. You know, none of us know everything, no matter how much we know, we never, we're never the expert. The animal is the expert and we're always working with a human caregiver and we're always working within that veterinary team. So there's a huge amount that I learn every single day from that. Um, I've learned a ton about time management and plate spinning. Um, the thing that really surprised me, I guess, is when I left Edinburgh Vet School, oncology had been my passion and internal medicine, critical care. That had been my thing that I'd done for very, very many years at a very high level at the university vet schools. Um, and clinical nursing was it for me. 
And when I moved down south for love, um, none of the thing that I had been doing for all this time existed anymore, but I had my passion for behavior and I sort of knew it a little bit and, and I wanted to learn more. So I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to take it easy. I'm going to get a training qualification. It's going to be joyful. I'm going to do fun things with animals all day long and it's going to be heaps of fun. Um, but actually behavior work is incredibly similar to my oncology work in that it's emotional. It's draining. Burnout is huge. Um, there's a huge responsibility, especially when you're a CCAB because you're clinically autonomous. Um, you have owner's hearts in your hands. You have these pets' emotional welfare in your hands. And so that for me was a real eye opener because I was just like, it'll be a fun little hobby and who knows if it'll grow. And all of a sudden you have this massive responsibility. So I, I treasure it, to be honest. I'm honored to have that responsibility, but you know, it, it's hard work and it's, it's sometimes very draining, um, but it's also very joyful a lot of the time. But yeah, I've learned business skills. I've learned crisis management skills, and, you know, all the stuff that you do when you work for yourself. And I've also learned to be very spoiled in that, you know, being employed is more difficult. <laughs> so much, so much learning. <laughs> there was an awful lot you've learned. And I imagine you, you, you carry on learning as you go as well, I suppose. You know, every single weird. day. Yeah. yeah, every single day. So we should always, I think we should always be open to that learning and celebrate it. Yeah, absolutely. Always be open to learning. Couldn't agree more. Um, so what kind of behaviour problems have you seen since the start of the pandemic? Really interesting, really interesting. So prior to the pandemic, my caseload was pretty diverse. Um, and there were things that you saw more commonly. Gradually, as the pandemic kind of kicked in after, well, first of all, everything disappeared from all of our diaries. And we were like, oh, my God, our businesses are over because there's nothing we can do. And then suddenly, boom, it all you know, was out of control. So first of all, a massive caseload, massive. I mean, I'm, I am turning away 10, 15 clients a week at the moment, which is really, really tragic because all of those people and all of those animals need care but the types of cases that we're seeing tons of and this seems to go with loads and loads of my colleagues is overstimulated over aroused um, animals who are constantly being interacted with and have no downtime and they've never learned to rest they've never learned to be self-sufficient because they've always had their humans with them their humans need them because we're upset and anxious and I love your topic for tonight how are you feeling on a behavior special that's ideal <laughs> our owners are pretty stressed and they're chronically stressed they are over relying on their pets in many cases putting a lot of pressure on their pets and so we have pets who they don't get to rest they don't get downtime they are constantly being like, let's play, let's do stuff, let's go for a walk. Um, cats have been moved out of their quiet spaces for home offices. And again, so we're seeing aggression, we're seeing possession aggression, we're seeing food aggression, we're seeing handling aggression, we're seeing this just huge high levels of emotional arousal, a lot of frustration, a lot of anxiety, um, which is really, really sad. And that's in addition to all of the puppies who did not get appropriately socialized or habituated. Um, so yeah, and I, I think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg right now. So I think it's gonna affect us for quite some time to come and it may potentially affect generations of pets as, as we move forward. Who knows, time will tell, I guess. Oh, yes, time will tell. Now, Linda, I could, I wish we had more time. I really do because you've just, you've got so much wonderful stuff to share with us, but I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up the interview. Um, That's not a problem. I'm I could sure... passionately talk all night, so please shut me up. <laughs> but I'm sure you'd be more than happy for people to contact you if they had any questions. Absolutely. And I'm sure please reach answer. out. My email address, I, I believe you guys have chucked it in the chat and my Facebook page is there as well. Please join me. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Linda. It's been an absolute pleasure. Right. Thank you very much for having me. Sorry. No, no, don't apologise at all. It's wonderful that you've got so much to say. Um, right, so thank you, Linda. Now we are going to go into a little session of poll questions from our sponsors bought by many. Um, it's five questions and they should be coming up on your screen soon. So if you wouldn't mind just popping your answers in there for us. So the first question is, are you able to confidently answer behaviour queries from pet owners? Yes, no, unsure. So I'm just going to read them out in case people can't access the polls. So you can pop them oh, into the everybody. chat. Yeah. So number one, are you able to confidently answer behaviour queries from pet owners? 
Number two, do you have a preferred behaviourist to refer to or recommended for pets with behavioural problems? Again, yes, no, or unsure. So do you have a preferred behaviourist to refer to or recommend? Uh, question three, have you seen an increase in pets with behavioural problems since the pandemic started? Yes, no, unsure. So yeah, that's, a, that's something we've obviously just been discussing uh, now. So that's number three. And number four, generally speaking, did pet behaviour seen in practice improve when clients had to stay out of the building? Interesting question. So generally speaking, did pet behaviour seen in practice by you nurses improve when clients had to stay out of the building during the pandemic protocols? So yes, no, unsure. And finally, question five, is it important that pet insurance policies include behaviour cover? So again, yes, no, and unsure. So final question, is it important that pet insurance policies include behavioural cover? So some really interesting and mm. illuminating, um, illuminating uh, kind of answers, I think, there. Yeah. I am just wondering whether Zoom's strange update in terms and conditions is stopping a few people putting some answers into the poll at the moment, because I can see we've not got anything that's coming through. Okay, so I think so, there, may, there may be a glitch in the Zoom yeah. world today. Please do pop answers in the chat, though, if you can do, because yeah. it'd be yeah. lovely to still have your insights. But I'm going to end the poll because I do think that Zoom's update has conveniently made that a little bit more difficult for us this evening. Oh, sorry about that, guys. But yes, if you could put your answers in the chat box, that would be really great. We'll give you a couple more minutes to do that. Yeah. So just keep keep the poll open and everyone just puts in the chat. So number one, yeah. put the put the put the number one in the chat and then Y for yes, N for no, U for unsure. Right. So number one, are you able to confidently answer behavior queries from pet owners? So Y for yes, N for no, you for unsure. Brilliant. That's great. So what you're doing now in the chat is exactly what we want you to do. Yeah. Okay. So are you able to confidently answer behavioral questions from pet owners? Yes, no, unsure. So all the answers are going to be yes, no, unsure. Okay. So number two. So put the number two for this next question. Do you have a preferred behaviorist to refer to or recommend for pets with behavioral challenges? Yes, no, unsure. Super. Number three. So put a three before you answer, and then put three, Y, N, or U. Number three, have you seen an increase in pets with behavioral problems since the pandemic? So yes, no, unsure. I think everyone's gonna say the same for that one. Um, number four, generally speaking, did pet behavior seen in practice by you in clinics improve when the clients had to stay out of the building? So number four, yes, no, unsure. And finally, with the number five in front of your answer, uh, is it important that pet insurance policies include behavioural cover? Yes, no, or unsure? That mm. is brilliant. Wonderful. I can see that chat box wearing away. So that's yeah. great. That's lovely. And thank you all so much for being so accommodating on the Zoom yeah. front. It's uh, definitely sent a few glitches today uh, across a lot of Zoom platforms. So thank you, everybody. Linda just really wanted to quickly comment on number four as well. I did. I did. I think it's such an interesting question because what does well-behaved look like? And we have a, a habit and a tradition of taking pets out the back, away from their owners. And in the pandemic, of course, that's what we all do. It's always what we do. Um, and we think they're better behaved. But actually, what we may be seeing is a pet who's super anxious and inhibiting and shut down. So just because they're easier for us to handle may not mean that they're having a better experience. And it may actually be a worse situation for them. So just very interesting on what everybody's observations are going to be and what our definitions of good behavior are. Oh, that's Definitely. interesting. Thank you, Linda. All right, I think that's everyone. So if everyone's happy, we're going to jump into our panel discussion with Linda, Zoe and Elle. So hello, guys. <laughs> I'm going to come to you Hi. first, Zoe. Hi there. Okay. Are there resources to point lockdown puppy owners to for dogs already showing signs of behavioural problems from poor socialisation? Yeah, thanks for inviting me to say. Um, as we know, um, poor socialisation does lead to nervousness, potentially aggression, 
separation anxiety. Um, as a profession, I maybe speak of many out there that are obviously seeing more dogs that are nervous. Um, I know when I work in first opinion and referral, there's often the mark on the cage to show care. And it's often these nine, 10, 11 month old dogs that are obviously showing this type of behavior. Um, because nurses, we have to be a voice for these dogs. Of their care, they're aggressive. Um, and I think we have to try and help these dogs and their owners. Um, there is some links that hopefully are on there um, of where we can direct owners to. Um, the Dogs Trust have a really nice um, resource where you can send owners to that really talks about, you know, the socialisation aspect, the separation aspect, and then obviously trying to find a trainer, a behaviourist um, that obviously is qualified to help with the problems. Um, but I don't think it's just a case of seeing the dog or the puppies and they're that way and then saying goodbye to them again. I think we need to be stepping in and trying to, you know, help because it's only going to potentially, you know, get to the adolescent stage. And then, you know, the owners, the owners would pre pandemic. Oh, I think Zoe might have cut off. I've lost Zoe. <laughs> um, shall we move on to... Yeah, we'll move on. I'm sure we can... And then if Zoe wants yeah. to answer anything in the chat as well, she can do. Um, so the next question is for Ellie. So um, how do you navigate professional boundaries between trainers and veterinary professionals? Hi there. I think Rami's decided to join us as well today. I'm so sorry. He's the worst behaved puppy. He's showing me up. <laughs> right on cue <laughs> i know um so obviously as a vet nurse um we follow the code of conduct um and trainers are unregulated um they don't have anything um to follow um with trainers we need to obviously work with them um what we do is we have recommended trainers that we've actually been out to see um to see what methods they use um so i'd highly recommend that um to other vet nurses and vets to do in their practices um make sure you know who you're obviously referring them to and make sure that they're not using debunked outdated theories um and there seems to be a lot of them at the moment especially on social media um we see them all over um tiktok at the moment um so yeah the main thing is really is i would say is to make sure you're obviously checking out who you're you know potentially referring to yeah so like building up a, a relationship with the practice and the yeah the exactly yeah so we've got a num we've got a few that we you know refer to and i think it's really important that you're referring to the right ones yeah cool awesome thank you very much thank you jack okay linda i'm coming over to you yeah do you think medication is used enough in practice I think medication is underused in general for behavior issues. I think um, we're scared of it a lot of the time because again, we don't get a lot of behavioral education as either vets or nurses. And so it's not something that's familiar. And I think in many cases, whether we're dealing with clinical behavior cases um, or whether it's patients in front of us in the clinic, I think medication can be an incredibly important part of the holistic care of that patient. And when I say holistic, I'm not talking like raw feeding and juju. Um, I mean, looking after the entire patient, I think we should definitely be considering that a patient with a behavior problem or a patient who is very, very emotionally aroused has changes in their brain chemicals, that's physical. And that's something that yes, we can change with environment, how we interact, handling, but also medication can be incredibly useful. So for example, in practice, most of the practices that I work with now, their default, their gold standard, and we also, you know, this is considered the gold standard at Fear Free, is any patient coming in for any procedure has pre-visit anxiolytics unless proven otherwise, because we can take it as pretty much all patients are going to be anxious to some level. And if a patient is anxious, then potentially they might shut down, like the patients we mentioned earlier, that's not gonna do anybody any harm, but they're not having a good experience. 
but the ones which become dangerous are anxious, but they can't get away. So they're also frustrated and frustration increases the vigor of behavior and causes dangerous behavior. So we don't wanna use medication to sedate and restrain. Um, people talk about chemical restraint. Um, that to me is a, no, restraint is not really what we want to be thinking about. We want to be treating the underlying emotional situation, which is anxiety, and then we have a patient who doesn't have a problem, so isn't likely to get frustrated and dangerous or isn't likely to shut down and be really unhappy. Same in, in clinical behavior cases. Yeah, I think we should use it judiciously and appropriately. And it often makes things a lot safer. It means we use less anesthetic. Um, it means patients are less stressed if they're going for anesthesia, so their risk is lower. Yeah, all day I can talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Uh, and our next question is um, to Zoe. So that is, what is the best way to deal with an aggressive patient without causing injury to ourselves? Okay, so I think like Linda has said, um, the emotion behind the behaviour is obviously key. Like with us, you know, when we're happy, um, I think we do expect a lot of them sometimes when they're brought into the environment when they're anxious and we expect them to behave and we expect them to, you know, be obliging to us. Um, I think patience is so important. And I think that obviously, as we all know, we're quite a rush, rush culture in the veterinary profession. Um, understanding the behavior, learning about the um, body language, interpreting the ladder of emotions and acting out accordingly. Um, and I think calm, slow and steady. I think a lot of nurses will know that if you are calm and slow about your approach um, and the restraining methods are kinder um, and that everyone should be adopting these types of behaviours and then they'll really see the difference. Perfect, brilliant, thank you so much. Right Elle, I'm coming over to you. How can you best approach clients with old-fashioned ideas or reinforcement such as punishment or dominance or following unsolicited advice found online? So I think we get this a lot in practice. I don't know about any other vet nurses, but we get this huge um, amount. I don't know whether it's just in the Southeast where I am, um, but I think education um, is the most important. I think if you go in there sort of all guns blazing or um, telling them that they're wrong, you're gonna have them on the defense straight away. Um, so I think education um, is the most important, I think. Um, the more we shout about, um, you know, that the dominance theory has been debunked now and, um, you know, these outdated methods just simply don't work in most cases, or they might work in the short term. Um, but in the longer term, you're probably going to find you're going to have an even more severe behavioural issue. Um, I'd also say that I don't think most clients... It, <laughs> In some cases, I think most clients don't even realize. I think it's a little bit of ignorance as well. Um, and, you know, I don't think necessarily they know they're being cruel um, in some cases. Um, I definitely think with the pandemic, um, especially down at the south where I am, we've seen a huge rise in um, prong collars. I haven't seen prong collars for ages. Um, and in the last month I've seen three so um, I think education education um, if we can just open up that conversation with them um, in a nice way um, rather than you know jumping down their throats that's the best way wonderful thanks so so um, the next question is to Linda um, so that is why are behavior qualifications not better regulated Oh, I don't know. Why aren't they? <laughs> can, can of worms. Like. <laughs> it's getting there. It's getting there. Um, so currently the ABTC, which is the Animal Behaviour and Training Council, and definitely the place I think we would all recommend that everybody goes to look for their trainer or their behaviourist, because you know that they are appropriately qualified and regulated by a professional body. Um, and then under the umbrella of ABTC, and hopefully soon to be under the umbrella of the RCBS, that's the place to go to. And they're really trying very, very hard to create a regulated profession with lots of structure. And then those who choose not to take part in that for whatever there, there may be good reasons for that. It doesn't mean that they're not appropriately qualified, but it certainly will help weed out those Wild West 
trainers and behaviorists that Elle was mentioning, you know, and, and there is a, there's a rise in it because of the massive rise in pet population, the massive rise in behavior problems. It's a cash cow. Um, and so people are just springing up left, right and center with their made up letters after their names. So the ABTC are very much doing their best. As I say, there are other organizations and my preference would be for everybody to pull together in the one organization rather than everybody trying to do the same thing separately. It, to me, that makes no sense. It's like, oh my God, we're not going into Afghanistan, but it's like everybody's sponsoring this, that, and everyone pull together, get out. Um, so it's the same deal, right? I think, I think that's why I think there's a lot of factions and that's problematic. Whereas actually we should all be pulling in the same direction and trying for something standardized, I think would be really, really useful. Um, and it's coming, it's happening. And hopefully it will mean the Wild West guys are, are out in the cold. Yeah. Awesome, thank you, cool. Over to you, Rachel. Okay, thanks, Jack. So over to you, Zoe, any ideas on how to stop on lead lunging? Okay, so as you probably know with my campaign, it's yeah. something that I'm quite, um, you know, uh, passionate about. Um, obviously, it's all about positive reinforcement and making it into um, a situation that's changing their mindset. You know, help with it. Um, basically, it's trying to avoid that confrontation. And can you still hear me? Because it's gone a bit funny. Yeah, you're still there, sorry. Okay, that's fine. Um, you obviously. Like with anything, the more you do something, you're better you're going to become. So if the dog's repetitively lunging and lunging and lunging, it's probably just going to continue to do it. Um, you have to have a treat that's better than any treat that there is, which is about finding what they're, you know, what they like more than anything. You might find, but then when you're out, they don't. And that's obviously a sign that they're too anxious to eat. So you're never really going to get any training done when they're too anxious to take that positive reward. Um, and again, it's building up the confidence. Don't expect too much. Um, again, I think we expect them to get to fit in two weeks. But I mean, I know from my personal own dog, it took a good probably 18 months of you know, repetition and getting him. And now he will look at another dog and look to me for the reward rather than look to the other dog to do the lunge. And it, you know, it's a really difficult thing. And I think owners need to be aware that it is, but it can be done. And I'm, I'm, you know, I've proved that with my own dog, but again, it's the emotions behind the lunging and the body language that we're seeing and having that professional help, which is key, I think. Okay, thank you, Zoe. I think we've got time for a couple more. So over to you, Jack. Yeah, so the next one is for Ellie. So it's um, quite a poignant one at the moment, I, I think. So it's quite hard for owners to spot the warning signs of behaviour problems in their pets as so they're often so subtle, um, not for us on TikTok videos, though. Um, as vet nurses, how can we help them spot the signs before it becomes a real problem? So I would definitely recommend a book, well, specifically for dog um behavior would be a book by it's Lily Chan's book and it's called Doggy Language sorry my puppy is moving my laptop sorry he's so naughty um also one thing that I really really recommend is um opening up the conversation with clients at every single visit um we do at our practice we have a short really short simple um behavior questionnaire even if you don't know anything about behavior um the questions are self-explanatory um, so we have one for cats one for dogs um, I think there's about 10 questions on there um, and it opens up that conversation for them to then spot those subtle signs before it becomes a bigger problem um, we do that at every single visit that they come into um, so especially the older dogs as well coming in you can maybe spot those early signs of cognitive dysfunction um, so we pop those, scan those, pop them straight on the file. So if anyone's interested and they want to have a look at them, I have two templates that I can send to people um, if they're interested in doing that in their practices. But um, it also opens up that conversation that a client might think, oh, is that a silly question? Or is that normal? Um, it opens up that conversation with them. Um, so yeah, I definitely recommend those because um, we can see how that behavior has changed over time. Awesome. That's brilliant. Thank you. Really helpful. 
Thank you. Right, we're going to have to look at wrapping up the panel discussion, but I wanted to do a quick fire question to all of you just before we finish. And it's going to be your top tip for anyone looking to branch out into behaviour. And we'll start with you, Linda. Gosh, top tip. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, yeah, again, as we mentioned earlier, work out what it is you're interested in. What do you want to do? And then go go find that. So get your CPD in and then start gradually, gradually building that side of things. And again, it depends what you want to do. Do you want to make it part of what you do or do you want to make it a career? And then follow that path. But, you know, learn from your learners and um, learn from every dog you do. And I think just to really reiterate what Elle has just said, talk about behavior all day long. Be, be a bore um <laughs> ask questions about it talk <laughs> to clients about it talk to your colleagues about it get into it yeah brilliant thank you and l um oh god um <laughs> me the spot. um so i would say um yeah like linda said um find out what your niche is what you really enjoy um and find people who are also interested in behavior like Linda. Um, she's uh, like fangirling here. Linda is my inspiration. She knows this because we used to email a lot. Um, and yeah, just make sure, um, obviously, like Linda said before, if you go on the um, APBC website, um, they've got their courses. So if you're looking to do it as a career um, and you want to be accredited, then you can look on there and they've got all the accredited courses on there too um, instead of going around the houses and maybe doing a course that's not accredited um, so yeah go on their website it's fantastic brilliant and very quickly zoe um i would say you're trying to make sure you search like which pathway you want to go to um, and i think just give yourself time to when you're doing the courses because I know you, you know, we have a busy job as in the vet, you know, vet world, and I think you have to be realistic. As I know from personal experience, you've got to be, you know, you got to be good to yourself, and you know, take the time. I think. Okay. Thank you very much, Zoe, and thank you, everyone. What a wonderful panel discussion that was. So much to cover, and again, I wish we could we could be here for longer. Um, but now it's time to go to our breakout sessions. So I will hand over to Katie, who's going to explain what's going to happen next. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to remind you we've still got the challenge open. So send your pictures or videos to happy hour at bbd.co.uk. Um, but now over to you, Katie. Thank you so much and thank you for an amazing panel as well. Now, theoretically, if Zoom hadn't just decided it was going to change everything in the last two hours, you, if you have signed up to do the fitness, should be going to a breakout room in a second automatically. Now, if you do change your mind, in theory, again, on the bottom of your screen, by the mute button, by the video button, you should find a breakout room button. So you can click that and you should have the, join, uh, the option to go and join. Laura Copley's fitness session. If you want to stay and do Jack quiz and you signed up for that, you should stay in this main room. Now, we shall see if that happens. If it doesn't, what Zoom doesn't realize is that this meeting is full of problem solvers and with lots of nurses and lots of vets on here. So we will get something sorted. So I'm going to um, click the button to open the rooms. If for any reason we don't go, we'll figure something out. Otherwise, when you are in the fitness room, we are going to, um, be asking you you can put your cameras on you don't have to but right at the end you'll be automatically transported back here so please don't worry about leaping out at any time we will bring you with us so I'm going to head to the breakout room with Laura and I shall leave you here with Jack, Ebony and Rachel. Thank you Katie. I should also say there will be prizes for each breakout session so if you're in with Laura make sure you turn your cameras on so we can see you. You might have to click on your more button at the bottom um, and that more button will give you an option to say breakout rooms and option to join if you want to go to yoga. So I've had to click on my more button on my bottom right. It might be on your top right or bottom right and then you'll see breakout rooms potentially come up. Cool. All right.
So get your pens and papers, people. It's quiz time. Quiz the quiz, time. quiz master <laughs> is, is here. Uh, guys, I'm going to give you until quarter past eight this evening to email your quiz answers to me. The email is the same as it's been all night, happy hour at bbd.co.uk. And quarter past eight will be the cutoff time for me to receive your answers. You can all tell Katie that I put this hat on because she requested <laughs> I've just seen the hat. <laughs> um, right, so um, you can't see my video that I'm moving. You can just see the screen, right? Yeah. Cool. That's fine. So it's full of memes, by the way, as well this, this week. So. <laughs> Love it. Right. So question one is um, behavior based. Um, so what is the name for this rabbit behavior? So it's obviously a picture, so you can't see it in action, um, but it's a bit of a jump and a twist. So we've got A, spinner, B, bungee jump, C, binky, or D, bouncer. So that is question number one. And we will move on to question two um, with the crazy tortoise man <laughs> at the top there. Um, and what is the collective term for a group of tortoises called? Um, so we've got a brawl, a creep, bunch, or a crash. I know this because I'm obviously a bit, bit weird. <laughs> so, can we get those answers down? Question three, if you need any questions repeated, obviously just pop in the, the chat box so we can go back to them at the end. Um, what is the name for when a guinea pig is happy and does a jump? So similar to the um, rabbit at the start. So we've got A, hot potato, B, jump pig, C, bean bounce, or D, popcorning. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Question four, we have a noise. So I hope everyone's got their sound on. And um, so what is making this noise? So there's either a cockatoo, sugar glider, a newborn puppy, or a marmoset. So hopefully this plays for you all. <laughs> so hopefully you can all... Um, Pick from one of those. I, I definitely would have got this wrong. Um, I'm going to so, play it one more time, Jack. Yeah, sure thing. <laughs> the dog in the room is going absolutely crazy <laughs> after that as well, so I do apologise. Um, <laughs> so question number five, um, a bit more sensible. Um, what was the term vet... Uh, what year was the term veterinary nurse first used? So we've got A, 1966, B, 1971, C, 1980, or D, 1984? So, moving on to question six. Um, which animal's fingerprints are closest in relation to humans? Chimpanzee, koala, gorilla, or an orangutan? Just as a heads up as well, this might not, hopefully it doesn't give it away a little bit, but the pictures don't necessarily mean that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that kind. <laughs> you might be bluffing though. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never that's know. The kind of thing, that's the kind of thing you do, I think. <laughs> I need to change my filter to something evil now. <laughs> <laughs> so question seven um, is guess the dog breed. So it's a bit of like a, a riddle almost. So I'm a large dog bred for working in water. I often have a grey coat and blue eyes. What am I? Um, and it is actually on that picture somewhere, um, which might give it away. And also you can pop in the chat whilst you're having a look. And it's if you could be a breed of dog, which dog would you be and why? Oh, that's a good question. My husband always says that I'm a rough collie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my mum used to breed rough collie. Oh, really? I mean, they, I mean, I should be flattered, actually. They are gorgeous dogs. So, you know, I'm not mad about it. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> 
I also just saw um, Linda's comment in the chat saying, is that me on helium? <laughs> <laughs> At the sound. <laughs> Well, Gillian White says she's a Labrador motivated by food. I think I could be a Labrador as well, actually. Elle said that she'd be a Labrador. Always I'm so sorry, Jack. I privately messaged you that. I have no idea how I did that. It's <laughs> fine. It's fine. I think Zoom's just going for it tonight. It is, isn't it? <laughs> but no, I think, yeah, Labrador. because or got a lot of Labradors tonight. Yeah, or I'd be like my Dachshund because he just literally sleeps neat as well. I think he's a <laughs> Labrador. <laughs> So uh, moving on to question A, um, what color egg does a peacock lay? I'm not giving you any um, answers to this, um, but there is two points on offer if you get the correct answer. Mm. <laughs> oh, Chantel, that's made me laugh. Chihuahua, look cute, but get too close and I'll bite. <laughs> oh, I love red setters. Some, uh, Leanne's put a red setter as one of my like dream dogs at one point. They are beautiful, aren't they? My dad always wanted a red setter. Yeah, or a Gordon setter, the black and tan ones, mm. I think. Yeah. Right, moving on to question nine. On which animal, so this was the, the little teaser question that everyone got, so if you were smart, you could have um, Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> on, on which animal would you find Henry's pocket? So A, kangaroo, B, platypus, C, a bat, or D, a frog? Um, there are other animals who also have this too. And that was me through college, basically. Not revising. <laughs> Moving on to question 10. Uh, how many species of, oh, that should say mammal. I do apologise. Land mammal. Should, uh, how many species of land mammal lay eggs? So we've got one, three, four, or five for that question. And question 11, which land animal has the largest tail? So we've got a giraffe, elephant, snow leopard, or a lion, and a random animal with a long tail that isn't on the list. <laughs> he looks like he's been caught doing something he shouldn't, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> So question 12 is, when was the RCVS established? Um, so 1866, 1901, 1844 or 1911? For any history buffs, I'm sure if Jane Davidson was in the room, she'd probably be able to get this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Question 13 is, which is the only land mammal not to fart? Um, so we've got kangaroo, polar bear, a seal, or a sloth. Ooh. We could do with these in practice, I think, just because then we wouldn't have to smell it. <laughs> that was question 13. So moving on to question 14. What is the most popular breed of pedigree cat? And that was in 2020. If Nikki's on the chat, I hope that she's on the on the ball with this. I yeah, she is. Yeah. <laughs> if Rachel or Katie Ford had anything to do with it, it would be yeah, option. I'll just say I'm I'm gonna say I know what one I would want. <laughs> I'm surprised the rag dolls are not featuring in Happy Hour. <laughs> I had to shut him out because he would be up here. He would be. He would oh, be Lacey's um, comment is brilliant. And um, the gum tree main coon. Everyone who comes in when they fought uh, a gum tree main coon, and it's actually just a domestic short hair, probably just a rather large one. Uh, question fourteen. So, um, a slow loris, which is pictured on the right there, is um, venomous. So, is that true or false? 
looks too cute really. I say that looks far too cute mm -hmm. doesn't it Question 16, um, I'm not even going to attempt to um, say that word. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> what is a hummer uh, hummer nuka nuka kwapapa? Um, They're quite good. <laughs> um, a parrot, crustacean, octopus or a fish? If anyone wants to give it a go, then feel free. In the last one, did anyone get... Full, full answers right, Rachel, in the last quiz. No, I'm trying to remember now, you know, no, I don't think we had all of them 100%, but we had a couple of people very close. Nice. nice. Yes. Yeah. Question 17 is, who is the current BVNA president? Oh, so we've got Joe Hind, Joe Oakden, Alex Taylor, or Wendy Nevins. That's probably quite mean because it's coming up to um, to change over time as well. Nice bit of product placement there, Jack. I like what you did there. Indeed. Sneaky. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> I got to off for using the wrong logo recently. You so love I... a bit of value-driven product placement. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> And question 18, if anyone's been paying attention to your social media, um, what is international, what international day is it today? <laughs> international Black Cat Day, International Dog Day, International Chicken Day, or International Rabbit Day? <laughs> People are quite pleased with that one, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and question 19 is, which animal is the Canary Islands named after? And it's not what you might think. Or is it? Or is it? <laughs> Ebony's on to me. We need to move her. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we have a tiebreaker question as well. So this is if anyone is on a tied a sort of answer question. Um, so this is one that I only I know the answer to. Well, should do. Um, <laughs> and that's how many how many tortoises does myself currently have? Um, I did have to go and count today as well because I forgot <laughs> the number. <laughs> yeah, my mum would agree with you, L. That is too many for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have had baby tortoises. They're the ones on my hand, and there's still some to hatch currently as of today i was going to say is it as of today as of today, as of today. <laughs> as of today there's probably some hatching tomorrow or the day after. okay so yeah and i believe that is it so yeah thank you everyone i hope you enjoyed um and good luck as well well done jack that was another cracking quiz there um i've certainly been scratching my head there's a lot of those i do not know um, I'll be interested to see how everyone else gets on when I start reading your answers tomorrow. Someone wants um, question 11. So question 11 is, which land animal has the largest tail? And you must email happyhour at vbd.co.uk. Question 19, please. Oh, We've got the others joining us in 10 seconds. Blimey. Oh. We've got too many questions that people want. <laughs> if people need them, they can email me as well or send me a message in the chat afterwards and I can tell them. Yeah. Question two. Question three and question seven as well. And just to guess the dog breed. And someone wants 13. That's 13. Great. Wonderful. Look, everybody. And that was 19. And then number 10 again, quickly. And nine. 
two seconds. How many species of land mammal lay eggs? Was number 10. Land mammal. And number nine? Is, on oh, which animal would you find Henry's pocket? Kangaroo, platypus, bat, frog. And there are other animals that have it. Cool. Amazing. Brilliant. How was yoga, team? All good. All good. Laura was amazing. Lots of energy going on. Fabulous, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've gone off video somehow. Here we are. There we go. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. So hopefully you all did. <laughs> Fantastic. So I think we've got everyone back now. So it's time to go straight into our winners of the evening. Now, you've been sending in your challenge pictures over the past few weeks and we've had them coming in this evening as well. You've got so many cute, well-behaved pets. Um, certainly much more well behaved than mine anyway here's some of them on our slides what and the winner is jack do you want to give me a drum roll <laughs> okay <laughs> the winner is victoria stearman and hopefully we shall have sit there we go this is bengal bruce oh look at him Oh, bless Isn't he gorgeous? So congratulations, Victoria. That is a £50 voucher that is going to be on its way to you. Thank oh, you very well. much to everyone who sent pictures in. There were so many, and it's always oh. so hard to choose. Um, but yeah, Bruce. Um, a girl who put in a picture of a cat. And okay. so moving on to the top tip winners, which is always very, very popular. And I think there was quite a few submitted again. So um, on the slide, there's a few that have been, been sent in. I've definitely picked up a few that I use in practice. So the first winner we have who is getting a £50 voucher is, um, is Casey Plain from Sinclair Vet Group. And the tip is to stuff a basket muzzle with hay with uh, full bunnies or guinea pig patients and that provides stimulation and keeps it all sanitary so well done to Casey and our second winner is Kate Divers and her top tip was peanut butter on a breadstick is a super way to positively reinforce behavior in muscle dogs so thank you very much everyone for sending your top tips in yeah thank you very much and well done to Kate and Casey and our wonderful panel helped us uh, narrow these tips down as well so thank you guys because we always have so many wonderful ones um, so now it's on to pay it forward and again this is one of my favourite things of the evening, it's always so nice reading what lovely things you all have to say to each other, you're each other's best cheerleaders and it's just it's wonderful to read it. Um, we have to have a winner and it's always so difficult to pick one but tonight it is SBN Siona Giles from Vets One, oh I don't know how to pronounce this, is it Crimplesham? Vets One Crimplesham? And she was nominated by Kim Grimwood and that should be up on the screen now. So congratulations, Siona. We will be in contact with you to arrange a lovely little hamper of just wonderful loveliness that will hopefully make you smile. So, so that so all that remains is to say thank you to everyone. So I want to say thank you to our panel guests for joining us this evening. Linda, Zoe, Elle, thank you so much. Uh, Wish we could have spoken to you all for longer because it was just wonderful. Uh, thank you to Jack for stepping in as co-host for me. You've done a wonderful job, obviously, with the quiz as well. So, so thank grateful you. to you. And thank you to Laura for jumping in, doing the fitness yoga session for us. I'm sure everyone had a great time there. Thank you so much. We also have our tech wizards in the background, Katie and Ebony, always doing a grand job helping us out as well. And also our sponsors, bought by many thank you so much guys for your continued support and last but not least you guys as well happy hour is all about you and you really do make it so thank you so much for joining us this evening cool and we've got our next happy hour as well on the 30th oh, we do, yes. thanks for the reminder jack don't forget to register for our next event it's 30th of september and we are going to be discussing brachycephalic breed health so the link should be in the chat box for you, and that's 30th of September. Wow.
have and then just get in the chat like what was your main take home from today it's always really nice to hear what people are taking home um so just pop like maybe what's the one thing you're going to research or do or share or think about um it's always good to, to hear that as well yeah we love to hear from you and please as well always feel free to email me at happy hour at bbd.co.uk i love hearing your thoughts suggestions what you like to see um always open to any suggestions so please do get in touch let us know what you want to see on these events amazing brilliant we've got to find my niche within behavior to bring up behavior more often in practice i definitely want to follow my interest in behavior when i have time to give it my all um, another take home was behavior questionnaires for patients um, to build a good relationship with local approved behavioral professionals um, and it's lovely to hear that you always feel so supported and get so many useful tips on these happy hour uh, to take on some CPD or maybe even a course on behaviour, this is wonderful. That a good behaviourist makes such a difference to welfare, couldn't agree more. Uh, and people would love the behavioural questionnaire templates as well as all the links. So Rachel, perhaps in the thank you email, they can yes. be inserted in because yeah, I we'll did arrange for those times, but I know they were hard to, to collect probably as we were talking. No, we can arrange for those to all be sent out for everyone. Super. Amazing. Fantastic. Oh. oh, I'm loving seeing just how much you're all planning to take away and do next. That's lovely. So we'll see you all on the 30th. Hey. Look forward to seeing you all again next month. Enjoy the rest of your evening, guys. Thank you so much.